Good evening. Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat. Yes. So, like Pastor Edwin said, I uh, I've been here a while. So hopefully, I know some Waray and Tagalog. But I did not preach the Waray Waray service. <laughs> um, just the morning one. But anyways, um, like you said, my name is Peter, and I grew up here in the Philippines. So it's kind of dark, but that's me, little me. And some members in the church actually remember me like that, and they see me now and they don't recognize me. <laughs> but I grew up here. My parents helped start this church. My dad also helped start Bethel International School. And I went off for college, and now I'm back again. But essentially, as a missionary, my life was very blessed by giving of other people. I don't know if you guys understand how missionaries work, but basically they don't work for a company or a boss that pays them money. Um, my dad essentially goes to a lot of churches in the States and raises support, tells them, this is what I'm going to be doing in the Philippines, and different churches commit a certain amount of money each week that goes to my dad's salary, and certain individuals give a weekly or monthly gift that goes to my dad's salary. So everything I had growing up all the way till I left for college was really technically given um, by people like you guys in a church somewhere in this world. So I'm going to steal Pastor Edwin's joke from earlier, but you could say I'm a very gifted person, right? <laughs> As a kid, you know, most of the things that I had, toys, clothes, um, those were all gifts sent in boxes from the states. And literally everything was provided by the finances that was given by people. And even more than that, my parents actually grew up as missionary kids as well. So here's my parents here by my own volcano um, before I was even born. But my dad, his parents were missionaries in Maspate for about 40 years here in the Philippines. And my mom's parents were missionaries in Africa, so what's now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but at that time was Zaire. So literally, most of my existence is a result um, of people's giving. And I wouldn't be here today if people hadn't been generous enough to give um, to their church and give to missions. So that's why I'm excited today to be able to share a lot of what I've learned with you guys. Obviously, I didn't understand it as a kid. Back then, I just thought I had a lot of used stuff, <laughs> right? Oh, this is old. <laughs> but now I understand, oh, these were gifts that people sacrificed so that I could have something. And uh, now I, I'm starting to understand it for the first time because I have come out myself as a missionary. So right now, I work at Bethel. I'm the campus pastor there, so twice a week, once for elementary and once for high school, I preach much like I am here to the students at Bethel International School and I also teach a few classes. This is my ninth grade class here. So in the process of coming out here and raising support, I really understood what it meant um, as a kid when I was given those gifts because I was able to interact with people in the States who made sacrifices and gave so that I could be here. And, and do this ministry. Otherwise, there'd be no way for Bethel to employ me as visa issues and all that stuff. But anyways, today, what we want to try and understand is this verse that is in Acts, but it's quoting something that Jesus said, which is, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that sounds a little interesting. A lot of us understand think we know what that means from Christmas. Oh, Pasco, right? Like, I'll give something, and that's fun. But re in reality, most of us don't really know what it's like to give. And I always love finding stories of people who are non-Christian, who sort of discover the same truths that were written in our Bible thousands of years ago, and they're like, wow, this is brand new, exciting knowledge. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of Tony Robbins, but he's really famous in the States. He travels around. He's a motivational speaker. He works with self-help, helping motivate people to be more successful in their life, more influential. And he has this book called Money, Master the Game, 
seven simple steps to financial freedom. Now, Tony Robbins is not a Christian, right? He doesn't preach the Word of God, but step number five in his book about how to break through um, and have financial freedom is give back. And he's quoted to say, the secret to living is giving. And I listened to one of his podcasts, and he set a goal for how much money he wanted to earn the following year. And his goal was that so I could give this much more. It wasn't to gain more for himself. So it's interesting. I always find it interesting when someone outside of the church, someone outside of, of the Bible, doesn't study the Bible, has come to believe the same thing that God gives us in the wisdom of the Bible. So today's message is titled, How Giving Will Change Your Heart. And that's really what I hope you guys will see today, is that giving isn't simply about other people being in need, but it's also about what's going to happen in your heart. So what do I mean by heart? Um, In fact, if you go in the Bible... It talks a lot about your heart. (laughs) Um, Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Right? That's a pretty powerful statement that the prophet Jeremiah is making about us. But if you have kids, you might think that's pretty true. (laughs) Who taught your children to misbehave? (laughs) You probably didn't teach them that. They just grew up doing that. Or if you watch the news and you look out at what's happening in our world today, our world is full of takers. No one is a natural born giver. We were born takers. And whether it's um, politics, corruption, murder, right? All these different things. It's all about taking, taking, taking. And we aren't natural born givers. But like I said in the Bible, it talks a lot about the heart. And if you spend time reading this, you'll notice that God cares more about why you do something than what you actually do. And when Israel was trying to find a new king because Saul had failed, King Saul was sort of the perfect-looking king. He was taller than everyone else. He was strong. He was handsome. But once he was a king, he sort of failed. So Samuel was out searching for a new king. And God told him, don't consider his, his appearance or his height, for I haven't chosen them, right? When he was looking at David's brothers, who were all taller, stronger, God said, don't consider their appearance, because people look out the outward appearance, and God looks at the heart. And Samuel chose David, who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. So that's what we mean when we talk about heart. And if you look at yourself, who taught you not to share? Right? That came, right, or that came pretty naturally for us. We were naturally selfish. We didn't have to learn how to be that way. Most of us have to learn how to give. So it's easy to say, see that what pro- the prophet Jeremiah said is true. So today, we want to learn about how that can change. And even pastors in many churches... When they teach about giving, they they talk about giving to get, right? Give your offerings to God so that he can bless you. And that's the same attitude of the heart that most of us live in. We give to other people so that we can get something in return. And unfortunately, although that seems nice in the short run, what that actually does, that message of giving to get, works greed and selfish in, selfishness into your heart. So as you give in order to get, you're going to become more selfish and more greedy over time. And God actually invented giving as a way to work greed and selfishness out of your heart. And as you give, the more you let go of this money, the more you can become a giving person. So I challenge you guys to, to ask yourselves, where, where is your heart when you give? Some of you guys tithe here on Sundays. Some of you guys give other places. But are you giving to try to win someone's affection? Are you trying to gain status when you give to other people, when you bless someone? Are you giving out of this feeling of duty? 
Like, I feel like I just have to. I feel guilty if I didn't give to that person. They're in need. But after you give, you kind of have this feeling of, I didn't really want to give to them. And that's not what Bible talks about when it talks about being a cheerful giver. So I don't want you to under, misunderstand me. I do believe that God rewards giving. And it says that many times in the Bible. But that's not the reason why we give. We don't give in order to get. It is true. And if you guys test the Lord and see that the Lord is good, he'll reward your giving. But that's not what I'm going to teach you guys today as the reason to give. And the reason is that God wants to give you something more valuable than your finances, which is a heart transformation. And in Ezekiel, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your old heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And that's the process we're going to learn about today. And what giving is going to allow you to do is to get rid of that old selfish, self-centered, um, greedy heart and get this new, loving, giving heart that looks a lot more like Jesus. But before we get into our points, I want to show a quick video um, that sort of summarizes a lot of the principles that the Bible is built on to, to get us started so that we have sort of a foundation. It's going to talk a lot about love. And I want, as you watch it, I hope that you guys look at what the video says about what love is. So try to watch for the definition of what love is. So let's watch this together. So if you've heard of Jesus, you probably know about one of his famous teachings called the Golden Rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this, actually, is a restatement of something else that Jesus said, that the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's really beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by the word love? It's an unclear word in English, because you can love your mom and you can love pizza. And if the word love means the same thing in both of those cases, your mom's going to feel real bad. So what did Jesus mean in his language? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in from day to day was a cousin language of Hebrew that is Aramaic in which the word for love is rachma. But then, as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, they translated them into Greek using the word agape. But here's what's fascinating. The earliest followers of Jesus who wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in ancient dictionaries. Rather, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So one time, Jesus was asked about the most important command in the Jewish scriptures. And he first quoted from the ancient prayer in the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus quickly followed up by saying another command from the Torah was also the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So which is the most important, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. To ask the question means you don't get his point. For Jesus, they are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people and vice versa, they're inseparable. And so this makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling for someone else that happens to you, like our phrase, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than yourself. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return, especially from people who are in difficult situations who can't repay you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. And he took this even further. Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person that you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them, expecting nothing nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. Now we wouldn't be talking about Jesus still today if he had only said things like love your enemy. This is how he actually lived. Jesus was constantly helping and serving the people around him in very practical and tangible ways. And he consistently moved towards poor and hurting people who couldn't benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the people who usually fall through the cracks. And when Jesus eventually marched into Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them, he allowed them to kill him. 
Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul put it, God demonstrated his own agape for us in this. While we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only son into the world so that through him we could have life. And for John, then, this leads naturally to the conclusion, beloved ones, if that's how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. So Christian faith involves trusting that at the center of the universe is a being overflowing with love for his world, which means that the purpose of human existence is to receive this love that has come to us in Jesus and then to give it back out to others, creating an ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love. And that's the New Testament meaning of agape love. So that quick video was put together by an organization called The Bible Project. And if you enjoyed it, they have lots of free videos online that really help you understand different concepts that might be difficult in the Bible. I really like that video because it really condenses and summarizes some of the most important teachings and the most impactful teachings that we can find in the Bible. But I hope you guys noticed that what it talked about is love means seeking the well-being of others without receiving anything in return, especially for people that are in difficult situations who couldn't repay you even if they wanted to, and even further to those that might even hate you, this enemy embracing love. And that's what we saw with Jesus. He moved towards those people that were hurting, people that couldn't pay him back, people that attacked him, and he loved them through really practical ways. It's this very others-focused self-giving love. And love is really when you expect nothing in return. Because if you're loving someone and you're expecting that they're going to give you something in return, there's another word for that. That's called manipulation. Right? And it happens all the time. People will say the right things. They'll do the right things to try to get you to give, some, give them something that they want. And that's not love. Love can only happen when you're giving to give, not giving to get. So our first point today is love requires giving. The video talked about how loving someone is more than just a feeling. It's an action. And pretty much every way you look at the action of love, it requires some form of giving. Every way that you could love someone close to you as a friend, a significant other, a sibling, a relative... It all invo it involves some form of giving. And for those of you who've read this book or heard about its teachings, the five love languages, all five of these languages here, words of affirmation, quality time, gifts, acts of service, physical touch, all require giving or involve giving. Gifts is just the one, like physical gifts or money gifts, but all of them require giving. So how did God love us. It says very clearly, and you might have guessed these blanks because it's pretty obvious, God so loved us that he gave, which is basically a direct quote out of this scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that's how God loved us is he gave. And if he hadn't given, if all he had said is, I love you, and he gave us nothing, none of us would be here today. We'd all still be lost. Without Jesus dying on the cross, we would have no hope, right? We'd have no salvation. So it's really important to us that God gave something. And he didn't just say, I love you, as a feeling, but he gave his son. And you can see that giving is the way that we demonstrate our love. So that's how God showed and proved that he loved. So other than demonstrate, that could mean prove. If you want to prove to someone you love them, you better give them something. Right? You've got to show them your affection somehow. Give them a compliment. Do something nice for them. But this verse, John 10, 18, 
talks about that last verse, John 3, 16, was about what the Father gave, which was his Son. But we know Jesus himself, he gave his life. Although in the Bible it talks about how he was arrested and crucified, but this verse clearly states that no one took it from him, right? No one took it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Jesus did not, his life wasn't taken from him. He gave his life willingly. And even today, God still demonstrates his love in his Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit gives us gifts and empowers us to do things that we could never do on our own accord. And it transforms our heart in the moment to allow us to love someone that we would normally hate, given the heart that it talked about in Jeremiah, right? The desperately wicked heart. So that's how we prove that we love God as well. You can't say you love God and continue living your way. You have to give your life to God. That's how we become saved. That's how we believe we get our salvation, is we stop living for ourselves and we start living for God. In Romans 12, 1, it says, give your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So God asks for a lot more than your money, right? He asks for your whole life. And that's what it talks about here. So if you're here and you haven't given your life to Jesus, I pray that you really try to grasp a lot of these thoughts and think about what it would mean for you to accept that gift that God has given you and give back in return to demonstrate your love for God. So the same thing, back to this, um, all of these, like I said, they're ways that you display your affection for your spouse or your loved one. And what's interesting about them is even if you really, really love your spouse, Gary Chapman, the author of the book, realized that some spouses or or marriages have conflict even though they love each other because they're communicating or giving the wrong language, right? The wrong display of that love. So even if you feel it, if you're not demonstrating it the right way, that other person is not really going to receive it. So giving is a lot more than our finances. Obviously, gifts is just one of the love languages. But today, that's what I kind of want to focus on is that aspect of giving. Because you can't love, like we just talked about, you can't love without giving, but you can give without loving. And this happens all the time. And this is what we're talking about with this heart transformation. Because your boss, sometimes they might love you, but they give you a salary. But if you stop showing up to work, they're not going to give you a salary anymore, right? They don't necessarily love you but they do give to you. So getting on to our last point here, the actions of loving and giving are central to the Bible. And I hope you really grasp that from the video, is that these actions, they're not feelings. Loving, love is not a feeling, it's an action. But loving and giving are sort of intertwined, and that's at the center of everything that we believe the Bible says. And this scripture here, Matthew 22, 36 to 40, explains it. This is a, a, a Pharisee asking Jesus, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So it was referred to in the video But clearly, as it's underlined there, you can't read the Bible, you can't believe the gospel, you can't claim that you're a Christian and skip the giving. God's kingdom that he's building here on earth, that he invites us to be a part of, his kingdom, is built on giving. And in order to be a member of that kingdom, we have to give. Jesus gave his life for us, so we could have salvation. God gave his son, Jesus, and this whole faith that we have in God is built on this idea of love and giving. So some of my points here I got from a sermon I heard from this guy, Robert Morris. He's a pastor in Texas. I actually went to his church. I actually met his daughter-in-law and his granddaughter. But essentially, he was interviewed And it was funny, they asked him, how often do you preach on giving? And he responded right away saying, every week. And the interviewer was like, wait. 
and he was really confused. And then Robert said, he was like, oh, well, if you're talking about how often I preach on giving money, then that's once every two years. But if you're talking about giving, it's every week. I can't preach on marriage without preaching about giving. I can't preach on any of these topics in the Bible without preaching about giving. And what's interesting, this picture here of this cup and water, I have a fun little illustration to show you guys this. But basically, this is not as infinite as God would be, but this is to represent God. (laughs) Imagine if there was infinite amount of water in here. And this is us. We're like finite human beings. We're limited. So God will give us and pour into us and give us life. But there's a point where we're full, and that's about it. And sometimes we sit there and say, hey, God, can you give us some more? I'd like some more. And he says, I can't because you're full. And the only way to receive more from God is if we then give some out and then receive some more. And you can give little bits or you can give a lot. And regardless of how much you give, God's always going to fill you back up. So a lot of us hear these teachings like it talked about in the video about loving your enemy. And you deal with some people that have hurt you badly in your life, maybe even your parents, right? Some people have been abused, some parents have gone through divorces, and we have these deep, deep hurts. And we're like, God, I can't love that person. I don't have enough love in my body to even love that person that's hurt me so badly. And what God tells us, and Paul reminds us in the New Testament, is it's our weakness that allows God's strength to be shown. And the same here, you don't have enough love, but even if you keep pouring out and pouring out and pouring out, just imagine an ocean, an infinite ocean of love behind you that is God, that continuously fills you back up. And you've probably seen people here in the church that they're always going, 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 serving, loving, and you're like, wow, how do they have enough energy (laughs) and enough love to keep doing? All of those things, and it's God. Right? The more you empty yourself out, the more God will fill you up. And it's not just giving works. It's giving money. And, but why do we want to talk about money today? Basically, a lot of people get tense when we talk about money. But money is talked about quite a bit in the Bible. In fact, the Bible, the main topic of nearly half of the parables Jesus told was money. One out of every seven verses in the New Testament deals with money. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, and more than 2,000 verses about money. In fact, 15% of everything Jesus ever taught was on the topic of money and possessions. So more teachings than heaven and hell combined. So what does this mean? Does this mean that money is more important than prayer or faith? Absolutely not. It's basically money is such an integral part of our day-to-day lives. And Jesus came to bring us practical teaching. It's really hard to develop patience sometimes. It's kind of this character trait. But money is like a tangible object. And it's a practical thing. You can't go through life without money. And that's why it's talked about in the Bible. God gives us instructions on how to deal with this thing. That's why there's so many verses. So what you do with your money is also evidence of what's important to you. If you look at someone's schedule and you look at someone's bank account, you usually figure out what their priorities are. They spend a lot of time with someone, they're probably pretty important. If they pay a lot of money for certain things, that's probably pretty important. So ask yourself, what do you spend your money on? Is it all for personal gain? to build your kingdom here on earth that will perish when you die? Or is it to build God's kingdom, right? An eternal kingdom where in exchange for that money, God wants to give you a new heart. And that's what we're talking about next. Your money has the power to transform your heart. And that's what we're talking about, this heart transformation. And your money has the ability to do that. Essentially, the scripture here, Romans 12, 2, says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. We talked about the pattern of this world, and the pattern of this world is giving to get. It's very selfish, self-centered, taking, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. 
of your mind. And God wants to transform your heart. He wants to renew your mind. He doesn't want you to fit in or be conformed to that way that the world talks about. And he wants to transform us using our money. So how does money do this? It's kind of like an exercise. Like if you go to the gym and you want to develop a certain part of your body, you're going to use that piece of equipment. And money is like that. But it's more of it's like a test. If you went through the Purpose Driven Life series we talked about, Rick Warren says life is a test. And what tests do is they see what people have learned. I give tests to my students. And when I give someone a test, I want to see, hey, were they paying attention in class? Did they actually understand what I said? Or were they just somewhere else? And God gives us a lot of teaching and a lot of truth in the Bible. And when we come to church, we get a lot of that teaching as well. But our money is a way that we test to see, have we really understood what this means? Do we really understand the point of the Bible, which is to love and to give to others? And there's all kinds of tests that we go, to, go through. In James, it talks about considering it pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds because those trials develop perseverance, right? It's this trade for some character, some sort of heart transformation. And that's the same thing that money is doing. Money is a tool that's used to change your heart. And when we experience need in our lives, when we don't have enough money, that's when we turn to God as our provider. I never learned how to trust God as my provider until I, ha I didn't have enough. When I always had enough, I didn't need God. It was just me. But the moment I had a need, that's when I learned trust God. So how do we know if we pass this test? There's this principle. This is one of the things I learned from Robert Morris, but it's called the principle of firsts, and it's everywhere in our Bible. I'll just give you a few examples, but trust me, there's a whole lot more than this. This scripture here is God speaking to Moses when he's giving the, the commandments or the laws, and he says, consecrate to me all the firstborn." Whatever opens the womb among children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. And if you went back to the Hebrew and read that phrase, it is mine, it's very emphatic. God's declaring, this is my property, right? The firstborn um, is his property. So God asked for the first. And why does it talk about children and beasts? It's because back then, that was how you measured someone's wealth, was either their crops or their animals. Nowadays, it's money. So that's how it relates to our money, and this is seen throughout the Bible. If you've ever asked yourself, why did God reject Cain's offering, but he liked Abel's? Right in Genesis 4, it says that Cain, in the course of time, brought some of the fruits of the soil and it said, Abel brought the firstborn, right? So Cain eventually brought something to God. But Abel, he brought the first. It shows when we give God our first, it puts God first in our life. That's why God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's. Even if you look at Jesus, God gave us first. Romans 5.8 says, while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. So before we did anything good in our life, before we had any faith in Jesus, that was when God gave. God, Jesus gave his life. God gave his son, right? He didn't wait for us. He gave first. And to make it clear, I'll show you guys an illustration. So let's say you get paid. So the word tithe that we talk about giving on Sunday in Hebrew means a tenth. So if you get your pay, right, you got 10 hundred peso bills, right? And that's your, your pay for the month, let's say. Um, tithe would be one-tenth, so 100 pesos. But which 100 peso bill is the tithe? We've just learned that it's the first, but how do you know which one's the first? Right? If your boss hands you this one, you're like, okay, that's the first one. No. The first is the first one to leave your hand. Right? So it doesn't mean that you go, okay, 
I've got my, my money. This is for Jollibee. This is for my ride. My new, my new cell phone. This one is for my rent, electricity. And then this is for God, right? That's wrong. <laughs> what God asked for is our first. So we take, okay, I've got these. Before I spend any of that money, I'm going to put this aside, and that's God's. I'm not going to touch that till Sunday when I bring it to the church. And this I can use to spend on my needs. That's what it means by the first, is the first money that comes out, the first money that we spend is God's. So what's interesting, if you look at this other verse, we must bring God our first fruits. Now, first fruits is the same thing as your firstborn. It's just talking about fruits and vegetables instead of animals, right? Remember, the Bible was written a long time ago. <laughs> this would say money if it was written today. But bringing the first fruits. So Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats brim over with new wine. Again, there's a promise that God does bless us when we honor God with our wealth. But Exodus 3, 9, and 10 says, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. So it's interesting here. We've been talking about giving, but this says bring. What would be the difference between giving and bring? Now, you can't technically give something that's not yours, but you can bring it. Right? If I was to hire one of you to go to the store and buy something for me, you would just be bringing this money to the store, and you wouldn't be buying the load on the way or using some of this to buy something for yourself. You just bring it and buy something and then bring it back. And that's what God is making clear here is that every good and perfect thing is from your Father in heaven. So what we're bringing to God is not ours to begin with. So we're not really giving it. We're just bringing it, what's already his. That's what was given to us, and it's responsibility for us to bring it to God. Just here, like I showed you with the water, is that our life, our love, um, everything that we have comes from God. And we're not giving, really, technically. <laughs> we're just bringing stuff to other people, <laughs> right? But essentially, we're a vessel Right? We're carrying what came from God and bringing it elsewhere. I learned this when I started to become a missionary. Right, I started raising support, and I was meeting with my mentor and developing a budget and looking at what do I have to pay for each month. And I have some debt in the States from going to college. And I was like, uh-oh, what do I do about this? I was like, this is money that people are donating so that I can be a missionary in the Philippines. Not so that I can pay my college debt. I was like, how do I, how do I pay my debt with, with this money? I was like, this isn't my money, so I can't pay my debt. And I said, am I supposed to get another job? I could figure out how to work online maybe and make some money on the side so that I could pay for my debt. And, and what my mentor said really stuck with me. Because I was talking about this money that people gave to me as donations, and money that I would go out and work for myself. And he said, how is that any more your money? And I was like, mind blown. I was like, wow, you're right. How is that my money, if I worked for it, any more than this is if someone gave it to me? Neither <laughs> are really my money, right? God's provided it all. God gave me my job, he gave me my talents, he gave me all those things, and he's provided that money whether I worked for it or whether someone gave it to me. And the Havala trip this weekend, and I don't share these stories about myself to brag, I just share because it's something personal to me that I've learned, and that's when it fully made sense to me. But this weekend, we, or last weekend, we did the, uh, the giving, and all the people were teaching about God is your protector and your provider to these kids, and we give them all these, this food, and we bring all these clothes, and where did this food come from, right? They're gifts from these, a lot of these leaders that are there serving, aren't just giving their Saturday, but they gave 
to have those gifts for the kids. And then I asked, do you guys have lunch? Right? But ubus na yung budget. There was no more for lunch. So I said, well, I actually have a budget that's specifically designed for me to give to people like this. I was like, can I treat you guys to lunch? So I brought them to Jollibee, and everyone's like, wow, thank you, thank you, wow. And I was like, guys, and I, I, I explained to everybody, I was like, hey, I know that it looks great that I'm treating you to lunch, but in reality, none of this is my money. Literally, Bethel doesn't pay me any money. These people in the States, they're really generous. They gave me money so that I could do things here. And I have a budget of a certain amount of money each month that I can give to people, right? I'm simply the bringer of this money. These people in the States want that money to go to people like you, and I'm just here to bring it there, right? It's the same thing like a relief organization here in Tacloban after Yolanda. If they went and used that money from themselves <laughs> versus gave it to you guys, um, that would be wrong. And for me, I was like, this isn't my money. This is actually for you. And that's what it feels like when we learn to give with the right heart, is it doesn't feel like you're losing anything. It's like, this is where the money was supposed to go. God gave me this money, and it's for this purpose to give to you. And it, it felt great, but I didn't do it to gain any sort of recognition. And what was crazy about the whole thing is it was way cheaper than I thought it was going to be. And I was like, wow, God provides. And they didn't go cheap either. They all had pineapple juice and chocolate milk, and then we had dessert. And it wasn't, it wasn't just the, the bare minimum, but God provided, right? So that leads us to our next point. Um, this is a little picture just so you guys see me becoming a missionary. That's my little prayer card I did in the States. But our next point, giving God your first builds faith. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about heart transformation, changing our heart, building faith, becoming more like Jesus. And a lot of people say the number one reason they don't give um, to tithing is that they can't afford it. And like we said earlier, a tithe is just one-tenth. So whether this is a thousand pesos or a hundred thousand pesos, you're still going to give a tenth. And the more money you make, the more money you're going to give. So are you ever going to be able to afford it? Right? It's always going to feel like more money. And when God trusts you with little, he can trust you with much. And when you give God first, it puts him first in your life, and all of your life can come into order. But if you put God last, your life can tend to fall apart. And this isn't just with money. If you give God your first with your time, what this looks like is morning devotions. It's the first of your day, that prime, I just woke up, before I do anything else, God, I want to pray and, and read your word and do devotions. Sometimes I wake up and look at my phone and realize, oh no, I have all these things to do today. I, can't, I don't have time to do my devotions. And what God's saying with this, with putting God first, how that develops your faith is that when I trust God that, okay, I'm going to give you this first part of my day and I trust that I'm going to have enough time I'm going to give you this first 100 pesos, and I'm going to have faith that this 900 is going to cover my expenses. That is what it means to build faith. Now, that's a practical way that you learn how to trust God. I've done some fun, adventurous things in my life. This is zip lining between two islands in El Nido. I've also been uh, skydiving. Here's me in a plane. But the scariest was bungee jumping. There I am right there. That was off a cliff in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, over the water. And the scary thing about bungee jumping is that no matter how many videos you watch or the fact that they've tied the ropes here, when you jump, your brain thinks you're going to die. <laughs> and it's not till you bounce that you're like, Oh, salamat Dios, wow, you saved me, right? And, and then you're like, whoo, and you're bouncing there, and you're like, that was really fun. But some people can't get the courage to jump. And they actually turn around and have someone push them over. Because they don't have the faith that that bungee cord is going to hold them. And that's the only way you can test this faith, is stepping out into something you don't know if it's going to work out. You don't know if this is going to be enough money 
for your bills, but you're stepping out saying, God, I have the faith that if I give you my first and put you first in my life, that you're going to bless this other 900 pesos and I'm going to have enough. I also got an opportunity to speak at Havala, and I was only asked a couple days in advance. And I was like, it was the same night I had to teach two different chapels for Bethel, and then I'd have to prepare a third sermon. So I'd have three days to prepare three different sermons. I was like, I can't do it. I don't have time. I'm too busy. But I really wanted to speak, and I felt God sort of pushing me towards speaking. And I said, maybe if you can't get someone by the end of tomorrow, tell me, and I'll do it. So end of the next day, he said, we still don't have anyone. I was like, all right. I don't know if I'm going to have enough to say. I don't know how I'm going to have enough time to prepare for these three different sermons. But I agreed. I said, okay, you can count on me. I'll speak. And that next hour and a half after I said yes was 90% of everything I said. I was just writing on my computer frantically as God like, showed me this is what I want you to say. And it wasn't until I stepped out and I wasn't sure I was going to have enough, that was when God provided, right? And God waits for us to step out in faith and put him first. And that's when he starts changing our heart tremendously. He, doesn't, he wants to take that selfish, greedy heart and, and change you from the selfish, controlling person into this loving, giving person to where when we give with this right heart that we're talking about, it changes lives, right? We've been talking about a lot of how it changes your life, how it transforms your heart, and it transforms everyone around you. It's kind of sort of exponential. It multiplies. It, it, it helps everybody. And God talks about the tithe, and we've learned today that God requires the tithe. This is sort of like, what is the minimum? You give 10% here on Sunday in the back. And here at TBC, we don't pass around the little thing. There's no CCTV camera making sure, oh, they did not give, huh? <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's up to you. It's between you and God. It's all about your heart. But don't just tithe. Don't stop at the minimum. Tithing is basically the minimum. It's bringing what's already God's to God's. God's saying, hey, I gave you that 1,000 pesos, that 100 pesos is mine. Remember, it's not that God needs our money. God's got all the money in the world, but he's trying to develop a heart of giving and selflessness in us. And this verse, Matthew 6, 19 and 20, says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust, uh, nor rust, rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So that shows us that here on earth, there's only so much our money can do. And God is trying to give us this exchange, which I think is an excellent trade. This money that's going to fade away, and I probably would have spent it on something worthless, I'm giving to God. And in exchange, God is transforming my heart and transforming the people around me. That's much more eternal and of an eternal significance than the money that I spent in this life. And people will tell you on their deathbed, they didn't wish, man, I wish I, I would have spent more time in the office. I wish I would have made another 100,000 pesos. That really would have made my life more meaningful. It's all about, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I would have helped more people. And this is how putting God first will help you overcome anxiety and worry. A lot of us are plagued with anxiety. We're always worried. When is the next bill going to happen? When is that tire going to pop on my car? When is the next bill going to hit? And when is all this stuff going to happen, right? And we have this anxiety and this worry. But if you look at Matthew 6, 33 and 34, it says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added or given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And this is talking about seek first God's kingdom. How do we do that? In our finances, we give God our tithe. We give him our first. That's putting God first, and all these other things will be added unto you. Everything else you need, 
And that helps you overcome. The more you live your life with your hands tight, gripping this money, I don't want to let it go, the more stress, anxiety, and worry you're going to be plagued with. And the more you learn how to let go and trust God will take care of it, the more we can be free of that. And the last thing in your, your bulletins is in God's hand, your gift multiplies. And we've heard this story many times, I'm sure, in Matthew 14, about feeding the 5,000. And this little kid simply had five loaves and two fish, and God fed 5,000 people. And that's what God will do with your gifts if you trust him and put him first, not just with your tithe, not just with your minimum, but give to the building fund. Give to ministries like Havla and InGen so they can do different things. But the biggest thing here, guys, I don't want you to miss the point. The laws in the Bible here aren't about God wanting to take things from you. God's not trying to take your joy and happiness away by giving you all these rules that you have to follow so I can't have any fun anymore. God's not trying to take your money to pay um, for this church, right? God is trying to give you a gift that has eternal value. He wants to transform the selfish, self-centered, anxious, stressed person into a generous, contented person who loves and gives without expecting anything in return. And when you start giving like that, it'll start changing everything in your life, from your marriage, your friendships, your finances, and all of that. So I pray that you guys learn and, and trust God. Step out in faith. Start giving your tithe and, and trust that God's going to be there and redeem the rest. So we're going to hear from Pastor Edwin about what are some of the things that your gifts are doing here in the church now and how God is using the gifts you're giving to change this city of Pacola. Thank you.